franktalks.com. All right, so we're coming up to the holidays. Uh, well, the holidays vacation time, and you know people are going away, and uh, and life is life is kind of coming to a halt. Um, working life, and people are going on vacations, and things are happening, and uh, a lot of us are alone, uh, not married, alone. Uh, widowed, not married, single for whatever reason we are, and we're alone, and all our friends and family are going away, and uh, we're we're stuck in the city all by ourselves. And uh, some of us are celebrating holidays, some of us aren't celebrating holidays, but regardless, there's going to be at least a period of three, four weeks where we're going to be alone, and uh, and and probably some of us really lonely. Uh, I, I asked relationship expert, and he, he's the world expert in relationships. His name is, uh, is Frank Kermit, and uh, he's, he's published a million books. A million. Literally a million books. And, uh, and you, you can find them all. If you go to Amazon.com and search Frank Kermit, there'll be like 52 pages of books. And, uh, and aside from that, he's, a, he's appeared on Oprah. And, and you, can't, you, can't really, you can't really argue with a guy who has appeared on Oprah. And he's been on the Howie Silberg show at least six, seven times already. So w- we welcome Frank Kermit to the to the airways to talk to us about this. And Frank, uh, I'm I'm very privileged and proud to have you on the show with me. I very much appreciate that introduction, Howie. Eventually, I will live up to it. <laughs> one day, most of one it will day. be true. I'll, one day, I'll make it to Oprah. <laughs> and, uh, and and of course, you could call in and ask Frank any question you want. The number to call, 514-738-4100, extension 200. So, Frank, a lot of people are going into uh, this, this vacation season, this holiday season, and uh, and they're going to be alone. And... And, uh, and, and all their friends and family are going to go away, and they're going to be looking at these Facebook pictures of people in Bermuda and people in Bahamas and people in Florida, and they're going to be sitting here in freezing cold December weather of, uh, and December and January weather of Montreal and, and get very depressed sitting in their homes alone watching television. All the reruns, yeah, yeah. It's, it's horrible. It's a horrible time of year for some people. So, so with all this holiday cheer and the, the lights and the, and the music and everything else, there are a lot of people who aren't very happy in this time of year, aren't there? Right now, because we're going into what's called the holiday season, uh, people either will have something to celebrate or it's time off to do something you've always wanted to do, maybe go on vacation. It's always a time of reflection. And some people who are unhappy with being alone really feel that unhappiness during this period of the year. And it's important to remember that not everybody is miserable being single. But if you're single and you're not happy about it, that's a problem. So why don't we talk about some of the solutions? All right. So what could somebody who's single and not happy about it do to, uh, to, to change the situation for themselves? First of all, you have to understand that you're in this situation because of a series of choices that you made leading up to this period of the year. So was there somebody who asked you out? that you always thought of as as a friend, maybe you're not fully attracted to them right away, and instead of giving them a chance, did you say no? And it's things like that you have to be aware of. But what what, what about the situation, sorry to interrupt you, but what about the situation where where, where nobody asked you out, and you've been been single for a while, nobody's asked you out, and nobody's even paid any, any attention to you at all, or even looked at you the right way. And, and so you're, you're kind of feeling rejected to start with. Uh, I'm, me, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to get the hypotheticals here, right? Well, we can totally address that. The, there's two things I want to say to that. Number one, you might not be recognizing the signs that somebody's trying to tell you they're interested. That's the first thing. What I see a lot in my client base is that th- they come in saying, nobody's interested in dating me, nobody wants to date me. And then they recite stories about having been to social events, uh, parties, uh, you know, going out with friends. And when I point out, you know, that friend of yours said that thing to see if you might be interested in going out. You missed the sign. That's the first thing. You might not be aware of the signs that someone is interested. The second thing is, let's say no one really hasn't made a move on you. There's got to be a reason. Did you put out a vibe? Did you put out a disclaimer out there saying you're not interested? Um, Whether you're a man or whether you're a woman, if you speak very poorly of the opposite sex, then the opposite sex isn't going to make efforts to spend time with you. If you're a woman who says how much you hate men, well, any guy who's around you that would be interested in dating you is not even going to bother trying. 
And let's say you were dealing with somebody who, for all intents and purposes, isn't pushing anyone away, but they're still not getting that kind of attention, then the only solution left is to put yourself out there. Figure out two or three things that you would love to do and go do them. Put yourself out there. Let people know you would really be open to meeting someone new. This is quite challenging for some people who feel shame, who feel guilt for saying, hey, I don't want to be alone. I want to meet somebody. Can you introduce me to someone? Look, I met a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago. He's, he's in his 50s. He's been alone his whole life. And he told me, look, I'm alone, and uh, I'm alone because you know I've dated everybody in the city, and nobody's like me, and I haven't been able to get along with anybody. Uh, I'm thinking maybe there's a common denominator there. Uh, maybe there there's a, something that he's doing that's, that's, that's repelling people from him. It's unlikely he's dated everybody in the city. Well, I, I, it's it's I, more we like... Need a lot of, you need a lot of nights to do that. Yeah. 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 Um, it's more likely that his standards are probably way too high. So he might, as, he might have actually dated everybody that qualifies to his standards. However, as, as a therapist in this field, here's what I can tell you. When a person's standards are actually higher than their social skill, usually that's a sign of some kind of fear of intimacy. They make it impossible for anybody to get close enough, for anybody to qualify for a date. So they can say, well, I'm looking, but I haven't found anybody. No, it's not that you haven't found anybody. Your standards are ridiculously high. No human being can match up to that. Therefore, you have an excuse to be alone, but the truth is you're alone because on some level you fear a sense of intimacy with another human being. So essentially what you're saying is that people choose to be alone. When they're, when they're alone for long periods of time, they choose to be alone, that they don't have to be, that it's, it's a conscious choice they're making or a subconscious choice they're making. I don't want to say it's a conscious choice because the fact is not everybody knows why they're alone. They know that they're not happy being alone, but they can't figure out on their own why they're in this situation. Sometimes they need an outside perspective to say, these behaviors are of someone who doesn't want to be with somebody. So let's give you an example. Let's say somebody grew up in a household where there wasn't very much affection, there wasn't very much love, and any time any affection or love was shown, it came with a price tag. It came with, uh, with, with, with feelings of guilt and shame. It came with, okay, I'll do this for you, but you know, you're going to have to do X, Y, and Z for me. And it causes the person not to feel like opening themselves up because they associate pain. I've had clients who were told as children by their own parents, you're not good looking enough, no one will ever love you. So they become adults on their own and they still carry those beliefs in their head that they're not good enough and no one is ever going to love me. So, so what adults say to children... Uh really affects them uh, if they respect the adult. So it doesn't have to be a parent. It could be a teacher. It could be a, it could be a coach. It could be anybody who says something, something derogatory like that to uh, a child. And, that carries, and they carry it for the rest of their lives, basically. It That's stays right. in their psyche, and it ca they carry it forever. That's right. You have to remember that throughout the process, children are never being entertained. They're learning. Everything that children are, 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 are absorbing, it's education. Even when they're being entertained, there's a form of education. And when any adult who's in some kind of authority fig uh, an authority figure says something like that to a kid, even if it's just because the adult happens to be in a bad mood that day, the adult is probably, you know, maybe the adult's not sober in the moment, there's always something here. Children absorb it and make it part of their identity. That's how children survive. Children survive by getting the approval of the parent. And when the approval of the parent is something that is negative, that becomes part of the child's identity. And we're talking about not just when the child is old, old enough to remember what happened as a kid, but even before that. All right. Now, how, at what age do children stop absorbing this stuff and start, uh, start like, making decisions on their own? Uh, is it in the late teens and early teens, or is it, like, when they finally hit 20 and 30 and 40? Or, or is this an ongoing process that, that lasts forever? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that, you know, if, if somebody who you respect, even at 20 or 30 years old, says something derogatory to you, it's still, you know, kind of irk at your psyche, and you can still, you still kind of get affected by it. 
I'll go on a record to say that I don't think there's any age where it stops hurting. At some point, though, the child grows up and understands that whatever decisions they make, they must suffer the consequence for, good or bad. And when they get into the habit of saying, well, I've made these choices for my life, that's when the outside opinions, even of a parent, may not have the same impact. But don't underestimate how much it can still hurt the adult when the, when the parent figure says something that is derogatory. It may not stop the adult from moving on or carrying on with certain decisions, but the emotional impact will always be there. We're talking with uh, Frank Kermit. He is a relationship coach uh, based here in Montreal. And, of course, you get in on the conversation. You have a question for Frank. You give us a call, 514-738-4100, extension 200 is the number to call. That's 514-738-4100, extension 200. Any relationship questions, any questions regarding interpersonal relationships, uh, loneliness uh, uh, during the holidays, any of these questions, you could call right now, 514-738-4100, extension 200. We'll take a little break, Frank, when we come back. The Howie Silberger Show continues right here on 1650 AM CJRS Radio Show Montreal and around the world on the True Talk Radio Network. Need help with love, sex, dating, or relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. And my guest is Frank Kermit. He is a relationship expert. In fact, he's the relationship columnist for the Suburban newspaper. You can find his uh, column online at suburban.com. And uh, Frank joins me here on the Howie Silberg Show. And, of course, we'll take your calls. If you have any questions regarding relationships or, uh, or, or, or interpersonal relationships or, or anything concerning, uh, concerning that, give us, give us a call. 514-738-4100, extension 200. Now, Frank, we we're talking about parents who, uh, who mess up their kids by saying derogatory things to them. Uh, but the same applies to teachers and other uh, authority figures. Uh, I was talking to a lady uh, last week, and she was telling me that you know, when she was a kid, she was a writer. And she loved to write. And then one day in grade nine English class, her teacher told her that she was a terrible writer and she should never write again. And she's always had a hard time writing since then. Uh, so, so the psyche, it gets into your psyche. When, when somebody you respect and somebody of authority that you really like and you really think is a, is a smart person and a respectful person, when somebody like that says something really derogatory to you, it could last. And this woman's in her 40s now and it still, and still affects her. She says she still hasn't been able to write anything decent since grade nine, since that teacher told her that in grade nine. It just deflated her and that was the end of her. What happened was, when the teacher said that, because she trusted the teacher's opinion, and she trusted the teacher to guide her, what the teacher said became the student's identity. So she has an identity to live up to, and that identity is, I'm not a good writer. And the same thing I have to tell you happened to me. Uh, when I was 14, there was a teacher who I got along with very well, and I told him at the time that I was thinking of going into the study of psychology and becoming a therapist. He gave me a 30-minute lecture about how horrible that profession would be. And it just turned me right off, and I said, well, I guess I shouldn't do that. At 14, I knew what I wanted to do, but I trusted that teacher. I didn't have anybody else guiding me. And that teacher, because he didn't like the idea of becoming a therapist, just told me it was the most horrible profession in the world. And it wasn't until I went through my own personal development where I challenged a lot of the beliefs that I had had all my life about relationships, about life, about choices, that I found my way back. So here I am now. I'm 40. I'm now a therapist. I'm now doing exactly what I've been wanting to do since I was 14. But does it, does it really apply to everybody? Because I know when I was in uh, grade 8, my English teacher told me you'll never amount to anything, and he continuously told me that the entire year. He told me I was a horrible writer, and uh, and I had a lisp, so I could never get on the radio, and I uh, I was ugly, so I'd never get on television. I've done all that, and I've been there, and I've done it, and I you know I didn't let it affect me at all. I mean, I just I just plowed through it. Uh, so, so does it affect everyone in the same way? I know no, it didn't it doesn't. affect me the same way. No, it doesn't. Look, there are some people that when they're faced with adversity, they use it as an opportunity to say, "Well, I'm going to prove you wrong." Or maybe it's other, they had other life experiences that make them realize that some people are going to like them, some people are not going to like them, but in the end, you have to do what you want to do anyway. Now, if you've had those kind of life experiences, if you've had those kind of, of cathartic moments when you're very young, then what a teacher or what a parent may say may not have the same kind of impact. It's still going to sting, but it won't stop you. 
If, however, you had a different kind of upbringing where you were brought up to be obedient, where you were brought up to associate that as long as I'm obedient, I will be loved, I will be protected, I will be cared for, that's when any sort of input, even a negative one, could easily come in and derail someone. 514-738-4100, 514-738-4100, extension 200. If any questions you have for Frank Kermit, relationship expert, now's the opportunity. You don't always have an opportunity to talk to somebody who's been on Oprah. So now's the opportunity to, uh, to talk to, to Frank Kermit. Frank Kermit, a world-renowned relationship expert. And he has the answers to everything. So give us a call. 514-738-4100, extension 200. You just give me a look, Frank. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't been on Oprah yet. Oh, oh. Well, he will be on Oprah sometime. Someday. Eventually. One someday. day, one day, someday, somehow. Or the Dr. Phil of Canada. That's right. That's right. We'll call him Dr. Dr. Frank. Oh, yeah, I'm not a doctor yet. So okay, we so we, we, we can't Frank, call him Dr. Frank. Not yet. All right, fine. But, but he is a good therapist, and, uh, and, and he could help you. So you've got to call him, 514-738-4100, extension 20. But you see, when people hear the word therapist, Frank, they, mm-hmm. uh, they, they get a little scared. Oh, because there's, st- there's a stigma to therapy. Absolutely, especially when you're coming in for help with relationships, for help with dating. Um, The title of therapist I have is natural therapist, so I'm basically a relationship coach who can give receipts. And one of the nice things about the way I conduct myself is that you'll actually get an opinion. You won't sit there and just have somebody nod at you and just listen to you. You're actually going to get an opinion, and we work on uh, actions you can take in a life plan so that you can change whatever it is you want to change. So, Frank, if the parent, parent-child uh, relationship is the problem, why aren't there, uh, why aren't there more courses and more, uh, more, more classes out there teaching parents on how to relate to their kids? Uh, I know there are some parents who don't even know how to talk to their children. Uh, so why aren't, there, why aren't there people out there trying to help parents you know, relate to their children and, um, and, and more courses, especially when kids reach, uh, reach puberty or kids get into the teen years, uh, things get a lot more complicated on how to deal with the, with, the, with the transition from child to teen, from teen to adult. Right now, there is a, a very huge lack of sexual and social education in our school systems. And the main reason is because these are the things that are expected to be taught to children at home. Unfortunately, that's not happening. And I do think that at some point in the future, just like I'm not sure which country it is, but there is a country that when a couple goes to file for divorce, their divorce application may be rejected. And the couple may be told, no, you haven't worked on this marriage hard enough. Go back. And I think you're going to see uh, major changes coming into the future where if people want to get married, they're going to be required to take some kind of a course on communication skills and conflict resolution. One of the dangers of coming in with too much regulation is that when you start to over-regulate people's ability to procreate and you start getting involved in people's rights to their own bodies and people's rights to start a family, you can end up in a bigger mess than what we have right now. So it's a very, very delicate balance because it's one thing to say, well, um, everybody should know some of the basics, but it's another thing where, where do you draw the line before you, I mean, how would you enforce it? You're not allowed to have children. How would you enforce that? Are we now talking about physical sterilization? I mean, like, it's a very slippery slope. But well, why, you start... would you, why would you say you're not allowed to have children? Why wouldn't you say, hey, if you're going to have children, part of the law is if you're going to have children, you get pregnant, uh, you go for your, uh, you go for your, uh, your prenatal uh, classes. But at the same time, you have to go for some classes on how to relate to children, how to deal with children, how to discipline children. How to, uh, so why, why, why would that be a problem? Well, I mean, we're not, we're not system, telling, we're not telling you, we're not telling you that you can't have a child. But we're telling you that if you're going to have a child, then you have to, you have to go through the courses. If you and want to drive you a feel? car, you have to take, you have to take courses. I mean, you want to have a kid, okay. you have to take okay. courses. Okay, let's look at the car example you just gave. Yeah. What happens if somebody doesn't pass their license? They don't have a car. They don't get they don't their license. They don't have a car. They don't get their and, license. And how would you? What? Ha- and what do you do if they happen to get behind the wheel of a car anyway and drive and get caught? You throw them in jail. Okay, so what would you do if you instilled a law that said, if you don't pass this course, you're not allowed to have children. The person doesn't pass the course, has a child anyway. What do you do then? You're going to put these parents in jail and leave these children without parents? 
Wow. Are you going to take the children away? Put them in foster care, which is not necessarily that much of a better system than than being with the original parents, uh, depending on the situation. What if the person who's doing the test, uh, it's it's a manner in which the test is written that the person just can't comprehend. There are people who, uh, and you know, like I can attest to this, there are people who are great parents, but when it comes to taking tests and schoolwork and a certain type of learning model, it's just not for them. They don't have the head for it. But they're very active parents. They're very involved. They get involved in their children's uh, school activities. So where do you draw that line? Again, it's a slippery slope. Once you start going down that path, you're causing some problems. I think that a better system would be if a child ends up um, in some kind of trouble. That's where you can go to the parents and say, listen, your kid is getting involved in a lot of things here. Now you are required to both attend some classes on anger management, discipline, and so on. You basically, you wait until the person... You know, you give the person the benefit of the doubt, and if they cross a line, that's where you would set up those type of classes. So, so you don't nip it in the butt at the beginning. You have to well, wait you, for the problems to happen before you before you react to them. Why can't but, you be proactive about this? As I explained. Well, I, understand, I understand what you're saying, but, but there must be a method, there must be a model that could be developed that you could be proactive about this without, without infringing on people's rights to have babies. What I would love to see is that incorporating into the elementary school, the high school, and even at the collegial level, classes about human development in terms of, again, conflict resolution, how to get along, how to be respectful of people's rights, understanding the difference between um, needing a certain level of order and at the same time being able to respect individuals' rights as long as they don't interfere with yours. So that would be a wonderful addition. Right, we're going to take a little break. Uh, my guest is Frank Kermit. He is a therapist. Uh, he's also the online relationship expert at the suburban.com. So visit his, uh, his visit suburban.com and look at his uh, column. It's on the suburban.com website. And of course, he's our guest here. He is a, he is a guy who's appeared on uh, CNN, on ABC, on NBC, CBS. There you go. There you go again. No? CTV, CBC, yes. All right. So he's been on all the Canadian networks. All two I'm of them. Global, and I'm a regular all three on, of them. Global, on Global Morning News. So you see, he's been, on, he's been on all three, three TV networks here in Canada. He's been on two radio stations. And, yep, that's and, right. I'm, an, uh, I'm a regular uh, monthly co-host on CJD. And for Dr. Laurie's uh, program, Passion. And, and he's written uh, a thousand books. You know, just once I'd like you to be a little bit more accurate, closer to 10, but I thank you. All right, we'll take a little break. When we come back, <laughs> you can call in and you can talk to Frank if you want. Number to call, 514-738-4100, extension 200. And Frank will answer any question you have, 514-738-4100, extension 200. Frank, when we come back, I want to talk to you about hermits. Need help with love, sex, dating, and relationships? Visit FrankTalks.com And Frank Kermit is my guest. He is the relationship columnist for the Suburban online magazine. Go to Suburban.com, click on the online magazine, you'll see his column there. He is a co-host of Passion with Laura, Dr. Lori Petito once a month on CJD. He attends. He attends. See, you attend the Howie Silberger Show. See, you're not a guest on the Howie Silberger Show. You attend the Howie Silberger Show. I attend. What's you attend. I attend. Yes. How is that different from being a guest? Um, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, but, but you attend the Howie Silberger Show. Uh, yep. Oh, occasionally here on uh, on Radio Shalom and the True Talk Radio Network. Uh, he's a columnist on truetalkradio.com. And uh, he appears on all the major, all the major Canadian, Canadian networks, as opposed to the minor Canadian networks. <laughs> 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 all three of them. <laughs> he appears on all three of them. And one day, just one day, he will be on Oprah. One day. Oprah doesn't even do a show anymore. But, yeah, but one I, day I, I know that she will do a special show just to feature you. That would be nice, wouldn't it? 
That would be nice. So, Frank, last week my sister got married. and um, Mazel tov. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, and after after the marriage, you know, everyone comes over to me and says, oh, you're next, right? She's my younger sister. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm the older brother who's not married. And everyone assumes that, uh, that, that, that I'm not married uh, because something dreadful happened to me or 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 something or something like you know devastatingly how as devastating relationship wise happened to me um are are there people who are happily single who choose to be single yes there are Uh, i'm not saying i'm one of them so don't get me wrong right because i mean yeah i wouldn't mind being married it wouldn't bother me but you know it it doesn't bother me to be single either okay well let's get away from the idea of something that doesn't bother you well it doesn't bother me though um, when you when you say something like, "Well, uh, the fact that I'm single doesn't bother me. The fact that I would be married doesn't bother me." Yeah. That doesn't tell me what it is you really want. That doesn't tell me what you're aiming and striving for. So, whenever somebody says it wouldn't bother me, I'm not interested in what doesn't bother you. I want to know what is it you want. But if I is said, it one but, of, but but you would be interested if I said it bothers me. Is it your goal? But you said it. But you you would be interested if it's, if I said it bothered me. If you say it bothers you, then I have a better idea of what your goals are. Uh-huh. When you say that whether I go one way or whether I go another way, it doesn't bother me, I have no opinion, that tells me that you really don't have a set goal. You're not saying that within the next five years I want to be married and start a family. I understand what you're saying. Mm-hmm. But maybe I am saying that uh, that within the next year or two I want to be married and have a family or not. Okay, it, when you're saying you would... Or not, it doesn't really matter. That says that you don't feel passionately either way. And that might be the reason why you're still single. You you're just it's not hurting you to be single, but it doesn't you're not longing to be married either. You're fairly content with whatever position you're in. Okay, so so I'm not the only one like this. No, not at all. You're not the only one like this. In fact, there's a lot of people that are happily single. If a relationship comes their way, they're open to it, but they're not looking for it. They're not, um, they're not seeking it. They'll go on vacation alone. They will keep their lives very fulfilled. They surround themselves with friends and family. And usually, for these people who are happily single, they're not the ones who are struggling with them being single. It's everybody around them. It's their family who looks at them and says, but aren't, aren't you miserable being single? Wouldn't you rather meet someone? Wouldn't you rather put yourself out there? And that's probably one of the biggest challenges for people who are happily single. And that is everybody around them isn't happy with them being single. And so that puts a lot of pressure on a person. It can put an incredible amount of pressure whenever you go out to the holidays and you have to show up alone and people start looking at you and saying, you know, have you met anybody this year, anybody on the horizon? And now, remember, your friends and family aren't doing this to be malicious. They want what they think is best for you. And in their view, a relationship is something that is fulfilling. It's a source of joy. It's a source of pleasure. Uh, it's, a, it's a way to enhance someone's existence in life. That's how some people interpret and view relationships. So they worry that you're going to end up alone. And do they not also worry that, you know, you get to a certain age, if you're a male, then people look at you and say, oh, he's not married, he must be gay? Um, there are various stigmas. Where, look, if you're not married and starting a family, there's going to be a stigma, and the stigmas usually are not very positive. So the question is, what's wrong with you? Are you too difficult to get along with? Um, Is your sexual orientation in question, as you would mentioned? Maybe... um, I mean, maybe you're just, you know, there's something blocking you. And as you had said before, people assume, was there something that happened in your childhood that turns you away from relationships? The fact is, is that relationships can be a source of pleasure. There, there's, a, there's a lot that people get out of relationships. The idea of not going through life alone, the idea of having somebody there with you. If you have a real desire to have a family, relationship is one of the easier ways to start a family. Um, and it's, it's puzzling for other people who, you know, who, who so desire to have a partner in life. It's puzzling for them to think that there are people in the world who aren't desperate for it. Is it normal not to be desperate for it? I would say that 
if you can't appreciate or if you feel blocked by wanting to experience the positives of a relationship, that would be my role to come in and say, well, what do you associate with relationships? In many cases, in many cases, those people that I have counseled who were happily single that came to me uh, with the caveat that if they were truly happily single, they wouldn't be coming to the relationship coach. Okay? Right. With that caveat. They come in and they say, well, look, I'm happy being single, but I just, I feel that something's missing. And what we do is we look at their history, and what usually has happened is that they've associated some measure of pain by being in a relationship. Whether it's, okay, well, if I'm in a relationship, I now have to think about someone else. I now have to be responsible for someone else. I now have to be more of an adult. I now have to do things when I don't really feel like doing them. I want the freedom. And, and then they go into everything that they hate about the possibility of even being in a relationship. So I will actually get calls sometime from people who listen to your show. And it's usually a parent saying, can you help my kid? Can you help my son? Can you help my daughter? The, my son or my daughter is in their 20s and their 30s. They're alone. They haven't even brought anybody home. I'm starting to worry. I, I, I know they're heterosexual. That's not the issue. But what's going on? Why won't they uh, bring somebody by? And, uh, and you know, the, the moms and dads uh, are, are very much interested in seeing that their children are happy and in their interpretation of what happiness means. Well, if mom and dad are happy, then the child's happy too, right? Um, in theory. In theory. If mom and dad... Uh, sometimes it's not even an issue of but, happiness. But nobody, nobody knows their their child better than mom and dad. Oh, I, I I would disagree with that. Would you really? I would disagree with that because a lot of times some some I wouldn't say all. Okay, I'm not going to say all. I can't generalize all. But I have had clients who come to me and say, I have no interest in even starting a relationship with anybody because of the example that my own parents set for me. And sometimes it's the very parent who calls me to say, come, you know, work with my my son or my daughter. And then you find out that the uh, the marriage or the, the, the relationship of the parents wasn't a very amicable one. So the children are going up and thinking, why, why do I get involved in this? So does that happen a lot, that divorced parents or parents that are fighting a lot, uh, the kids, are, are, kids find themselves uh, in, in relationship problems when they get older? Uh, this, oh, this kind of, so much. This kind oh, of you, goes from generation to generation? You know, I, after so many years of doing this, here is some advice for couples, especially if you're a young couple and you're contemplating divorce. Unless you're dealing with something incredibly insidious, such as uh, violence, such as death threats, such as uh, drug use in the home that's like, you know, putting your own children. Into, unless you're dealing with something com completely insidious, stick it out. Go back to your marriage and work on it some more. What ends up happening is that, and I, and I see it in my practice, I see older people coming into my practice saying, I regret getting divorced. I regret Really? really? You don't hear that very yes. often. Oh, I see it in my practice. They come in, and by the time we finish, they sit there and realize, I should never have gotten divorced. And one of the major reasons that they regret getting divorced is how much it disrupts the lives of their children. And, and it really does, doesn't it? It does. So, look, there are times where you have to get divorced. There are times where your life is in danger. Get out. Major drug use happening in the home. Get out. Protect your kids. There are times where divorce is the right answer. But what I have found is that in many of the cases, the problems that get brought up that people divorce from, there's usually underlying issues. And when these people enter new relationships, maybe even a second marriage, those issues are still there. Changing the partner didn't change the problem, and the problem is still there. Meanwhile, your children who are now going back and forth between two houses, possibly going from one school to another, having no sense of stability, these are the people who are suffering so that when they become adults, they don't want to see their parents. So they it, it, it gets me so... I, I get very upset sometimes... Not not the people coming in saying, "Wow, I really, you know, I messed it up. I really shouldn't have divorced my partner." I feel bad for the kids, because the kids involved end up having such a, a, a negative attitude towards life, such a negative attitude towards relationships, that because because all they were exposed to was people making some horrible choices, people who weren't able to manage their own negativity with their partner. 
So how do you fix that? How do you fix a problem like that? Uh, are you talking about the problem with the kids or are you talking about the problem with the adults? Well, let's go one and the other. Okay, number one, don't fight in front of your children. Okay, don't involve your kids. Don't fight with the kids. Don't go to your kids and, and badmouth the other parent. That's not how children process things. They're not adults. If you are a parent and you badmouth the other parent of your child, your child doesn't say, oh, mommy and daddy don't get along. Your child says, I'm half of mommy and I'm half of daddy. So if one of them doesn't like the other, that means that parent doesn't like me. That's how a child thinks. That's how a child absorbs things. Don't fight in front of the kids. Don't involve the kids into your squabbles. Don't play custody battles just because you want to get back at your ex. Okay? Children feed off that negativity and it becomes part of their identity. Okay? You're not the important one here. Both the father and the mother, it's not about you anymore. The minute you decide to have a child, it's about that child. It's about what's in the best interest of that child. You don't matter as much as your child does. It's very hard to people. People are generally narcissistic. It's very hard to convince people that uh, they're not they're less important than a child. I've actually heard uh, people say in my office, "Well, look, my I have a very resourceful daughter. She's seven years old. She'll be able to deal with it." And I'm looking at them at, "You're not able to deal with this. You're coming to me. What makes you think that your seven year old is even more capable of dealing with this than you are?" It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. We're talking with Frank Kermit. He is a relationship expert, and uh, he's the suburban relationship columnist. Go to suburban.com. Uh, click on our magazine and his columns in the magazine. Uh, feel free to call in. If you want to. If you have any questions for Frank, give us a call. 514-738-4100, extension 200. That's 514-738-4100, extension 200. Not very often do you have the opportunity to have free relationship advice, and here you do. Here we do. An expert is on the line with us, and we're more than willing to take your calls. So 514-738-4100, extension 200. Any questions you have about relationships or uh, or interpersonal relationships or, or anything or anything to do with that, give us a call. 514-738-4100, extension 200. Frank, we'll take a little break. When we come back, the Howie Silberger Show continues right here on 1650 AM CJRS Radio, Shalom, Montreal, around the world, on the True Talk Radio Network. Need help with love, sex, dating, and relationship issues? Help from Frank Kermit, the best-selling author and Canada's most international relationship coach, is only a click away at franktalks.com. Coaching available in person, by phone, and by Skype. For singles, couples, and alternative lifestyles, franktalks.com. And my guest is Frank Kermit. He is a relationship expert. He is the suburban relationship expert. Go to suburban.com and check out his column in the magazine. He also writes for truetalkradio.com, which is our official website. Frank's a blogger on truetalkradio.com. He's appeared on every major uh, TV network here in Canada, all three of them. And, of course, he's here on the Howie Silberger Show, which makes him big, big time. Really brings him up to the big time here. And, uh, of course, we, uh, we invite you to call in if you have any relationship questions. 514-738-4100, extension 200. That's 514-738-4100, extension 200. So we're going into the holidays now. A lot of people are having big family dinners and, uh, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, and you started dating somebody two, three weeks before the holidays. And, you know, you really haven't introduced them to the family. Uh, maybe the family's heard a little bit about them, but you really haven't really brought them home and now you have like these big parties and dinners and office parties and uh, and holiday dinners and all sorts of stuff and you need a date and you've been dating this person for two three weeks how do you integrate them into your life it's not about how long you've been dating the person it's about the level of commitment that you've reached if the two of you have reached a point where you're already thinking marriage and saying, yeah, this is it, we're going to be committed, we're going to start a family soon, this is it, then even if you've only been dating a couple of weeks, uh, the holiday season is a great time to bring that person around to meet the family. Oh, wait a second, a couple of weeks, uh, could you really be that committed after a couple of weeks? I know you got married yes. after 24 hours, I, I understand yeah. that, but that, that's an anomaly, that's not the general rule. Um, I, well, look, whether you've been, look, there are people who have been dating six months and they're still keeping it casual. And after six months, they're saying, well, I don't really know. I don't really know if there's a future. Can we just keep things the way it is? 
um, even at that point, even if you're dating for six months, no, you don't bring that person to meet your family. It's not based on the amount of time you're spending. It's based on the level of commitment you've earned. So whether it's two weeks, and yeah, I agree, not everybody's, uh, not everybody can commit to somebody that fast, but it does happen. So the answer is simple. If you're committed for something long term, yes, you meet the family. If you are not committed for something long term, then no, you don't introduce the family. So, what about office parties? What about other parties? Office parties, the same rule applies. If you have, like some office parties will say, bring your significant other. Other office parties say, no, this is strictly for employees. In the case of an office party that says, bring your significant other, if the person that you're dating is not your significant other yet, you don't bring that person. I've heard horror stories in my practice of people who brought a friend to an office party and because the person walked in and, and was just a friend, that person was actually spent most of the evening getting to know their co-workers, getting hit on by the co-workers since it's just a friend, and then of course talking about their boyfriend or girlfriend that actually exists. Oh, I'm here with so-and-so, but we're not a couple. I have a boyfriend or I have a girlfriend. And it never made the employee look good. The employee always looked bad. The bottom line is, if you're going to go to an office party with a friend, either it should be someone that you are dating, that you're just introducing as a friend, even though people aren't stupid, they know they're, the two of you are a couple, or don't bring the person. Don't bring a friend to an office party. It is inappropriate. All that's going to happen is your coworkers are either going to try to make moves on your quote-unquote friend, or people are going to look at you and say, why did you bring a friend? Don't you have someone in your life? Are you trying to pass this person off as your partner? It, 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 there's no way it can look in your good in your favor. So just go alone? Just go alone. All right. So does, wouldn't the same thing apply to, uh, to visiting family or to, uh, or to visiting? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you don't have a significant other, then you go alone. So you really have to just be ready to make a commitment before you bring them around. So, uh, so if I just started dating somebody, and yeah, we kind of like each other, but we're not really you know into it yet, right? Um, if you haven't even talked about marriage, yeah. If you haven't, if you haven't talked about, listen, down the road, five, ten years from now, do you want the same things I want? Oh, are we compatible on these things? Great. Uh, what else? Do, what else do we have in common? What other values do we have? Do we want to raise our children the same way? If you haven't had these type of conversations where you're saying, I want to build a future with this person, then no, you should not be bringing the person to family functions. You should not be bringing the person to office parties. Okay, so that really would cut out half the people that go to family functions and office parties, right? Essentially. Yeah. But it makes things a lot easier and a lot smoother. So, now, when, just when, so, so when, how long into a relationship do you start talking about this stuff? Uh... Yeah, you, you don't do it on the first date. Oh yeah. Well, apparently you oh, did. Yeah. I mean, you got married 24 hours after you met your. your no, wife. no, we got we got engaged. Engaged 24 after 26, hours. 26. 26 hours, hours together. So, so we the got extra engaged. two hours makes a difference. Um. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it did actually. Look, when you start when you go on a date with somebody, you find out what it is you have in common. The more positive responses you get about what you have in common, the more serious the questions get. So a question such as, what would you do in a situation where your child was being bullied at school and the principal was doing nothing about it? That's not, a, that's not the first question you start with. You'll start off with questions such as, so what do you like to do? What do you like to do for fun? Now, if it turns out that you have those things in common, you move on to the more serious questions. But how serious could you get on a first date or on a second date uh, without, scaring, without scaring the other person away? I mean, you think, you, think about it. You know, I, you know, you're sitting across the table from somebody, or you're sitting, or you're sitting in the car with somebody, or wherever you are, and you're sitting and talking to somebody, and and you're saying, well, what would ha you know, what, how would you react if uh, if a rapist broke into the house and raped you, and uh, you know, how serious do you get, right? You go, <laughs> you go to the level of of what if you're raped? No, that, that question's I mean, ridiculous. I, I know it's ridiculous. I mean, it's ridiculous. But, but, question, but come on, but, think, but, I, but you I understand what, what I'm saying say. here? Yes. You, you escalate, provided that the other answers you've received previous are, are, are positive. 
of responses. Okay. So I'll, 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 let's just do something fun here, okay? Yeah. Uh, I'm on a date with a girl. We're talking. We're chit-chatting. And I happen to ask her, oh, by the way, do you uh, smoke cigarettes? Now, she says yes, that she smokes cigarettes. I already know that I cannot marry this girl. I have asthma. I got sleep apnea. I can't be in a house with a smoker. Right. Okay? So as soon as I find out that she smokes cigarettes, I'm not even going to be entertaining the questions about where we're going to live in five years, getting married in the future, how many kids that she wants. It's not my interest uh, because I know it can't go there. Well, maybe I can date her casually for a while, and let's find out what what her boundaries are, what her parameters are, what her rules are for so those. What would be the point in dating her casually if you don't, if there's no future? So why even bother? Because there is a value in dating somebody casually. If nothing else, you get some dating experience. You get experience in figuring out what it is you do like, what it is you don't like. I'll give you an example. Let's say you uh, meet somebody. You like each other enough. But you already know that you'll never be married. But you like the person enough, and it turns out that the person um, has a, very, a specific type of profession. But that profession requires the person to be out of town three days a week. And you've always thought, well, I, well could I be married to somebody who's out of town three days a week? You know, I, I probably could. I don't know. You go through the dating process to go to have that experience, to see what's that what that like, so you know what your actual boundaries are. So that's she, the value. So, so essentially, you're just practicing. You're using that person just, to practice. As long as they know that there's no future, then they enjoy your company as well. Yes, you're getting some practice in. The biggest element of practice is so that aren't, you aren't get, we always taught you can't use people, you shouldn't be using people. So what you're what you're suggesting now is to actually use somebody. No, what I'm suggesting is that as long as you are clear that there is no future for the relationship, and if the other person agrees, you're right. We we're not going to end up married, but we do like each other. We would like to see each other a little bit more. Let's go out and have some fun in the meanwhile. And when one of us or both of us meets our soulmates, we'll stop dating each other. Maybe they'll just date for two or three weeks. The idea is that you don't cut somebody off just for that reason because through the process of dating, you're learning more about yourself. You're practicing setting boundaries. You're practicing communication skills that you're going to take with you into your marriage. Imagine you're dating somebody and the two of you have your first fight. Well, there's conflict resolution skills that you can put into practice. There's, there's skills of, okay, look, we had a misunderstanding. Can we talk about it? And because you're involved with somebody, there is some emotion there. If you have no experience having to work out a situation where the two of you have had a disagreement, if you have no life experience there, what experience are you going to be able to offer your future husband and your future wife? There is a value to practicing anything. So that when you finally get into a marriage, you know what it is you want. You know what pitfalls to avoid. Sometimes the rules that people have that help make a marriage successful, they're not rules that people would think of consciously. But it's something that comes up in their dating life where they've tried it and they say, this is not a rule I'm going to be comfortable with. Frank Kermit, thank you so much for joining me tonight. Appreciate it. Frank it's been wonderful, Howie. Very intense. Frank Kermit is the relationship columnist for The Suburban, suburban.com. Visit, uh, visit suburban.com, click on their magazine. His column is there. He's also the relationship columnist for truetalkradio.com, so you can read his column on truetalkradio.com also. Franktalks.com is his website, so if you want to contact Frank outside of the radio show, and I know a lot of people are sometimes embarrassed to talk to you on the, on the air, Frank, but if they want to contact you off the air, they could go to franktalks.com, and all his contact information is there. And, of course, Frank is always welcome back here on the uh, Howie Silberger Show. Thank you so much, Frank. I'm Howie Silberger. This is the Howie Silberger Show on 1650 AM CJRS Radio Show Montreal. We're heard around the world on the True Talk Radio Network. If you need help with your relationship Advice is better than your mom's. He knows what you're going through. Cause Frank has been there too. So log on to franktalks.com. Frank 
TikTok.com.